Should I say something? Okay. Ah, okay. Está bien. El hablar uh, hoy uh, a ustedes, pero como él ha uh, dicho, yo voy a hablar en inglés, porque es mucho más rápido y mucho más... Slowly, ok. Ok, I will try to stay slow. No problem. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that I can, can talk to you today about uh, Volcan Kisapu, but there's actually two reasons why I came out to... Chile this time, I'm not going into the field, and I actually have spent uh, today and the next few days at, uh, at a place that's called um, uh, Colombia Global Centers, and I'll talk about this first because this is actually shamelessly some advertisement a little bit, what I will, would like to do in the next few months, and I'm hoping to, to uh, get people's attention here in Chile and, and potentially build on, on this talk and on uh, a couple meetings that I hope to have in next week at the um, at the workshop uh, at, at the Congreso Chileno de Geológico. So um, what I would like to talk about first is the, these global centers. And uh, again, this is a, a quick, uh, shameless advertisement. We, uh, I'm, I'm part of Columbia University. We have uh, uh, all these big universities in, in the US are trying to connect further into the world. And uh, some are doing that by having different kinds of campuses, uh, sometimes just a single campus somewhere in Beijing or wherever. Columbia University decided to do that very differently. They want to be really global in the sense that they are connecting with all sorts of groups uh, all over the world. So they decided instead of having one single campus, they uh, uh, developed what they call global centers. And they have eight of those distributed around the world. And one happens to be in Santiago de Chile. Um, and that is... Um, of course, is one you, you didn't know, and that's that's exactly why I'm happy that I'm here. <laughs> so, um, so the of course these centers are meant to connect uh, Colombia scientists with local scientists all in the region, not just Santiago, but the entire uh, entire Chile and uh, actually Latin America, uh, as much as they can reach out uh, in this context. And one way to fill these centers with life is through proposals uh, put forward by the by the people at Colombia. And I happen to be successful in one of those proposal calls to get money from Colombia to actually start kickstart uh, collaborations and kickstart uh, connect building new connections with the uh, um, people that are in, in Chile and, and uh, yeah mostly in Chile. And with the context that I proposed, it always requires some when you try to get these these proposals from funded through the president of Columbia University, you always have to sound very. Um, Social, social sciences have to be important, humanities have to be important. So that's the title, the dual role of volcanism from the foundation uh, of our civilizations to their potential destruction. And if we um, decipher that, it really means geologic ha hazards associated with volcanoes and, uh, and uh, mineral resources associated with volcanoes. Uh, we, we can talk about this in a moment, but they are, they, they are related, obviously, right? So this is... Uh, um, um, this is this is what what I've put forward, and what we would what I would like to what I'm actually organizing right now is a workshop to be held here in Santiago de Chile uh, in in February for three days to build connections between Colombia and Lamont Earth uh, Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory as a whole uh, with colleagues in in Chile whoever is interested and whoever wants to uh, be connected through this this kind of uh, workshop, and then I'll ha I'll head out with a, a slightly smaller group. 
hopefully, depending on how many people would, will join me uh, uh, at the workshop, to the field component around Kizapu and take them into the field, learn something about that, that amazing uh, site. Dates that I've just put forward here are, are preliminary, but I, I think more or less they will be only shifted a few days for, for them back. So uh, if you are interested, if you know other people might be interested in those kind of uh, connections, uh, talk to other people, let me know, uh, and get in contact with me. Uh, but just to give you a little bit more information what this is all about, it's the goals are really to start to build better connections between Le Monde and Chile, the Chilean geologic community. Uh, I know that actually Chile is very well connected uh, with its geology throughout the entire world, so this is actually not that easy in some ways. And so I'm, I'm putting this forward, and, and hopefully uh, this is, there is going to be at least a, 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 some uh, good connections coming out of this. Um, one way to do this is by uh, hopefully having significant involvement of students. Uh, and this is, these are the goals that will be uh, discussed at this workshop, how to potentially get students from uh, Chile to Colombia and, and vice versa. Uh, and of course, then ultimately all of this comes together by doing research together and identifying different kinds of goals that we have to, put, to, get, uh, to move forward in our understanding of volcanic systems, both in terms of their hazards as well as in terms of their uh, potential for, for uh, mineral resources. And then, who are we? Just uh, not everyone may, may, may really know who, uh, who I'm representing. Columbia University itself is, is, uh, no, is in, in Manhattan, actually. So that's uh, not where I'm actually mostly located. Most of my time I'm spending at a little uh, big campus, uh, a little off to the north of Manhattan, where Le Monde Doherty is, one of the largest and well-known uh, Earth, in uh, Earth science institutions. Um, with about 200, 300 scientists basically working on all sorts of earth science problems. And then, as uh, I pointed out, we do are connected to uh, the South American uh, community by this global center, which is out in Vidakura, uh, just around these embassies. I was there yesterday today in the morning. I was like, well, this, if I'm having this workshop, I'm not going to have it there. I, I'd prefer to have it somewhere in the city uh, so that we can have a, a better evening discussion too, because that seemed pretty quiet out there. Anyways, uh, so if you, if you would like to get in contact uh, with people from the Global Center, they are more than willing to make connections. And uh, it doesn't have to be on volcanoes. It could be on glaciers. It could be on biology. It could be anything. And they really are, are, are a great resource uh, to connect to, people, to scientists from Le Monde and probably even beyond. Um, who we are, I'm just putting out a few, few faces here just to get a sense of who are the, the uh, mostly the geochemists and, and petrologists at, at Le Monde. Um, so you get a sense of what, uh, what the group is that is involved in this. Mostly it will be me and Aina Lev who are more interested in, the, in volcanic hazards. And then on the global center side in Santiago is Karen Poniacic, you may know her from as a minister of uh, mining and engineering and energy in, in the first Bachelet uh, administration. No, but she uh, is an excellent resource to connect people. I, we, I, I spend a lot of time today with her, and I, I think uh, it's, it's great to have her on board for Colombia, I guess, but it's also a great way for, for the Chilean community to, to, to make connections potentially. And she, I think she has connections to all these mining industries, right? So that's, uh, anyways, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, all right, so this, this is just my, my quick shameless uh, advertisement, and I'll move on from there now. Um, keep that in mind. If you have interest, contact me. I'd be excited to, to get people uh, in, uh, in, in, interested into this. So now I would like to uh, talk about Vulcan Kizapu and in particular talk about uh, magma mixing uh, uh, and how this is at Kizap, we're really a great place to study uh, the consequences of mixing and, uh, and the, the features that mixing will produce. I've, uh, I've listed all the people that are in many ways involved in, the, in, this study, in these studies that I have done over the years. And one, one reason why I would like to have this workshop is if you look at this number of, of names, there is not that many Chileans, and I would like to uh, have more collaborations and more connections with the Chilean community. Um, 
I'm pointing out two people here in particular, Adrian Fieger and Adam Simon, because in my second part of the talk, I'll talk about some new results we are just uh, putting out for publication. And so these are the two uh, co-authors of those studies. So that's why I wanted to highlight uh, those two. Uh, the other people are involved over the years, have been involved over the years. And uh, without them, uh, the research would have not been possible. All right. So let's, let's get into um, Vulcan Kizapu. But first, let's uh, step back a moment and think about convergent margin processes and understand why magma mixing is actually important and, and what kind of reference frame one should see that. And, and I like to put this always in context of the time scales and the length scales that we're dealing with when we think about convergent margin processes. They are they're ranging over huge time scales and length scales. And of course, I'm just putting up here the ones that are really uh, at, the, at the large scales for both in both cases in terms of tectonic processes and, and magma, magmatic systems, mineralizations, those are the questions that we ultimately want to understand. But we always, we always have to actually go at the smaller scales to really learn something in greater detail about them. So for example, if we start to understand, uh, think about the processes that really are taking place in magmatic systems, it is uh, mixing, mixing uh, processes, crystal settling. And these are just uh, some ranges of time scales and length scales we want to access in this context. Um, my work is typically associated with the smallest scale. Uh, and, and these are still related uh, to all these processes. When I want to understand what can the crystals tell me in terms of a record that is, you could call it the climate of the magmatic system, uh, providing in terms of understanding these, the larger scale processes as well. Okay. And then, of course, uh, one thing that I would like will will address in a moment is the, the context of uh, that the large length scales we also have very fast processes, and these are always associated with eruptions. Um, and uh, this is I actually chose two point two to two topics for this talk today. One associated with the volcanic hazards, and the other one that, uh, in some ways, is much more related to um, maybe even ore formation. That's a, well, something that could be discussed. So actually in line with what I just said about this workshop. All right, so there is no question that mixing is ubiquitous on Earth. It's always the question, how important is it in, to, for our understanding of the various processes that are taking place in the, in the crust? Um, and this, these are just three examples that show us. This is from, uh, from California, these two actually, to show the, the inter integrate uh, mixing of mafic and felsic material on all on, on, large, on the medium scales, but of course, if you were to zoom in, also on the crystal scale, this is from Kisapu itself. You see these beautiful mafic enclaves. Again, another evidence that mixing always very often plays a role. And and in, in in these cases, we can actually see it. In some other situations, we have hybridization, and it's much harder to actually decipher that mixing is taking place. But it is it is. Uh, more and more recognized as, as an important process, even in places like the, uh, the ocean islands, basalts. So mixing is important. And it's, it's one, one, one place where it is important is, of course, in terms of feeding volcanic eruptions and triggering those. And then mixing uh, plays a, a role in, in how the, the magmatic system as a whole is, uh, is building up its diversity and complexity. We, always have a hard time understanding how this, the diversity actually translates to greater depth. And, uh, and the, just to kind of finish my, my broad introduction here, we usually think of an, a mature arc system as a system that may be uh, you know, best represented by that cartoon, I don't know. It's a very favorite one by the community um, where we have a lower crustal uh, zone where processing is taking place. And exactly also mixing is all, uh, another place, uh, another important process within this context. Uh, as this mature, what I like to call a mature arc system is evolving, what typically happens is that we are starting to lose the connection to the mantle source. Uh, and it's hard to understand what really the mantle, ma mantle compositions uh, that are leaving the mantle are as, uh, in, in such a complex evolved uh, mature arc system. For a different talk, maybe I, I think this is not the only mode. I think sometimes magmas can actually rise rapidly, even in a 
in a in a system like this. But this this is for maybe for later discussion. Of course. It's the, the hot zone really is mash in, in new words, and I, I would call it right. And so it really is that uh, at the at the lower uh, in the lower crust we have magmas that, that are not uh, making it their way right away to the surface. They first stall there. They start to fractionate. They start uh, crisp, uh, start to melt a little bit back the surrounding country rock, and and but by putting a lot of melts into the lower crust, you're also of course heating it up, and that's why people like to call it the hot zone. And one um, uh, the one thing that people uh, why people I think like this is because we often when we look at magmatic systems, we most of the evidence we have of processes taking place that are stored in the crystals are coming is coming from the shallow crust and the argument in these hot zones papers is that you have all this stuff all the processes going on down there but as magmas are rising they're rising rapidly adiabatically and you back everything that you crystallize down there and so that's one reason why we never have a good record of these lower crustal processes unless we go to crustal sections and then uh, can look at them in, in, in situ in place right um, but generally I mean it's in some ways there is a bit maybe a little bit more petro petrology related to this entire concept, but overall it's the same mesh concept. All right, so this is just to get everyone a, a little introduction, a little uh, um, overview of, of what is, are the systems I'm, I'm dealing with. Now let's have a look specifically at Volcan Kizab, when I want to, in, to convince you by the end of the talk that this is a, a great site to look at magmatic processes. Um, and that's because we really can uh, have a simple, relatively simple system that it doesn't have all that complexity that I just showed you. So we can, we can look at magma mixing in a very uh, mechanistic way and really understanding um, it from, from a kind of two, two end member point of view and not multiple end members. Um, and the two topics I would like to address are uh, how is mixing and recharge altering eruption dynamics. This is something that may have, some of you may have seen. This is already a few years old, but it's still uh, worthwhile to discuss because it's still, I think, not, uh, you know, it's still, it still could be discussed how important it is. I'll get into that in a moment. And then the, the, the new, new topic that I want to address in the second part is what happens at the interface as two magmas mix wide. Uh, so um, Mixing, of course, is always seen as, as an invective process. So you have two fluids or two magmas that are mixing, and that's what really drives the diversity. Um, but uh, but uh, if you think about it carefully in terms of mass transfer and truly making out of a black and white marble cake a gray cake, you always need diffusion. You always need the actual transfer of, of, chemistry, uh, of chemical elements from the black to the white and vice versa. So we really, this is going to be looking at the interface of what is happening as two magmas are interacting with each other. And all of this in the context of Kizapu. Um, this is, uh, maybe I can go over that quickly in this context here. Yeah, everyone knows how, what the geodynamic setting is in, uh, in, uh, in the southern volcanic zone. Kizapu sits right uh, uh, in the uh, transitional southern volcanic zone. Um, north of Tata, San Pedro, and Longaví, and uh, is obviously a, a, a produced from the subduction of the Nazca plate, uh, leading to the, the, the volcanic chain we have in the Andes. The nice thing you can al already see, Kisapu is, is, is quite interesting and famous because it had one of the largest eruptions in Chilean history, and you can see that it, in this picture not well because my triangle is almost covering it up, but you can see those eruption products still from space today, even 80 years after the eruption. And so this is now the field site uh, in uh, uh, close up. So this is Volcan Kizapu right here. The, the interesting thing, and that's what I will employ in the next uh, 10, 15 minutes, uh, is the, the com com contrasting and of these two eruptions, the 1846, 47 eruption was, which produced a huge lava field and you can see it over here. This is the Cordillera, and then these lava flows are going to the west. And then uh, f uh, about 80 years later, we had a similar size eruption, but uh, a Plinian style. And uh, so now this is, this is 
that's why Kisapu, I think, is a great place to study magma mixing and uh, or what drives eruption styles because we have these two eruptions of similar size, uh, only 80 years apart, and we can uh, explore what may be important driving these differences. Yes. People who don't know the area can uh, outline the volcanoes. The volcano is Cerro Azul. No? That is Cerro Azul. Absolutely, yes. Uh, that is Cerro Azul, and then to the left, which you don't see, is Descabezado Grande, for the people that are not familiar with that area. And uh, Kisapu is so only this flank vent that you can see here. We'll I think we have a few more pictures uh, that I'll show later. Um, so why is this a, a great place to look at mixing? And because, as I said before, it's a really simple system, in my view, that makes life a lot easier compared to many other arc systems. We, if you look on a potassium over silica plot, uh, this has been shown not by just by us, but Wes Hildreth already showed that in the 90s. We have this whole mixing array, and this is one element. You can look at many other elements. We always see these simple mixing arrays uh, between a mafic end member, uh, maybe that there is a little bit of diversity in there, but a, a relatively well-defined mafic end member and a really well-defined uh, silicic end member and in between uh, all sorts of compositions. The red, as you can see, is the lavas, and the yellow, on the other hand, you can see, is really much more restricted. So there is already one difference. One is obviously showing a lot more diversity because of mixing and because of input from mafic magmas, while the Plinian eruption shows a lot less of this kind of um, uh, mafic input. Why should we care about uh, whether a volcano erupts explosively or, uh, or diffusively? Obviously, there's a huge impacts for infrastructure, people, and so on. And this is just to kind of highlight this. The 1932 eruption uh, really, as I said, is one of the biggest eruptions in Chilean history. This is the isopac or the ash limit that was really delivering ash all throughout the entire or large parts of South America. And some people even argue that there was great uh, sunsets in South Africa because of the ash that made it all the way to South Africa. Um, this is the 1932 eruption. If you were to look, think about the, the, the footprint of these lava flow fields, of course, that's uh, uh, the um, Kisapu is this red dot over there. And the, this lava flow field has a footprint that is much, much smaller than that. So understanding why a volcano erupts one way or the other is, of course, of great interest. And especially when you think about this magma that is involved, the silicic end member is really the same. It looks like at the first glance. And we'll look at that in a moment uh, in, in greater detail. Let's just have a few more pictures of, of the kinds of rocks that, that we find in the field. Yes, uh, what I said before, there is a lot of uh, diversity in terms of glassy day sites that show very little mafic input. There is these um, mingled day sites that, you, that are so common to arc volcanoes. Or nothing, nothing really uh, um, unique for Kisapu. And then there is what I like to call hybrid anisites, which are really uh, on, on the macroscopic scale, you don't see any difference. But once you start to look at the crystal scale, you see all sorts of uh, end members. Uh, not all, you see those two end members, I should say. Uh, and this is in contrast very much so to the homogeneity that we find in the 1932. This is one of the, actually one of the, uh, uh, in the literature and in the community, seen as one of the most simple eruptions that exist for Plinian eruptions. Very, if you look at this uh, ash, uh, uh, this tephra deposit, there is very little grain size variations. There, this column was very stable, and most of it was producing the same kind of uh, dacitic magma with this one exception, so-called brown band. And only towards the end did uh, Kizapu's column. Uh, collapse, and then you have these beautiful, still quite visible, quite well visible pyroclastic flows that are co covering the valleys in the area. So, in terms of physical volcanology aspect of going into that area, it's also a beautiful site to really learn something about uh, hazards and f physical volcanology because it's still uh, really all in place. This doesn't work. This would have given you a little overview of, uh, of the area with a slight flight over. Sorry, but since we moved it over to the next, uh, to the other computer, unfortunately, I can't play this. I could try, but I, I doubt it will work. Yeah. All right. So I showed you major element variations. And now let's start to look at it in, in more, uh, more detail at the crystal scale. 
This is just one example of a blow up of this is an enclave. If we start to look at the contact, such an enclave, and this is something I've shown for years. It's just always something that it, it makes it easy for everyone to grasp. Uh, a simple backscattered uh, electron image of a contact like this. And if we start to, to identify the different kinds of crystals in this image, I'm highlighting especially the orange and the yellow. What you can see is that in the day side, which is the top part here, you see orange crystals and you see yellow crystals. Uh, and in the, in the darker part, you only see yellow crystals. Showing that really as, this two, as these two magmas mixed, this was solid, and this is not uh, surprising. This is a mafic magma that got quenched and, and basically was solidifying uh, on, on recharge. And then it was just slowly disaggregating, delivering uh, crystals into the day side as this magma was, was mixing. So this is how we generate these mingled day sites. Uh, and the mixing is really going from this way to that way. Um, so this is um, a nice way to show that there is, and, and we can really clearly identify these end members quite nicely and recognize that these are two, two very distinct end members and that, are, that come out quite, quite nicely in each uh, geochemistry plot that, uh, that you would want to generate. And uh, I'm just going to show you iron concentrations in, in plagioclase. Uh, there is always a nice, uh, well-developed peak at these very um, sodium-rich plagioclase uh, compositions with low iron. Those are the ones that are daysite derived. And they are the same. This composition is the same whether you look at hybridized endocytes, whether you look at mingled endocytes, uh, daysites, whether you look at uh, um, whether you look at the 1932 daysites. You always have that kind of composition. This is the stored magma in the shallow magma in the in the volcano uh, in the interior of the volcano, and it's it's identical in my view whether you look at 1932 or whether you look at 1846. Okay. Then the recharge, I have to admit, is maybe has a little bit more diversity, but some of these diagrams tend to over over um, emphasize the. Uh, kind of outliers, you know, when, whenever you work on, on these rocks, you, you look at a new crystal and you're like, oh, I've got to me measure it. Whether it's really a representative crystal or not is, is a different question. So these diagrams, in my view, tend to overemphasize outliers rather than really showing the, the true picture of the, the, map, the overall volumes. So, but we can see that there is, there is clearly uh, end members that are more uh, anothide rich and uh, and more iron rich, which is basically these yellow crystals over here. All right, so this this is the context from the uh, crystal chemistry, and I, I of course can't show you all the data. I'm just going to show you a few few uh, examples of the data sets, uh, and then the other thing is that I want to bring home here for a moment is arguing for the fact that these the dayside magma that is involved in these eruptions is identical in both cases. And if you look at amphibole uh, you can, uh, compositions, you can start to extract pressure and temperature uh, and water content. And as you see here, there is, of course, some, some, some uh, variation in temperature and pressure associated with the compositions in amphibole. If you focus in on the ones that have a black uh, rim, those are the ones that are the rim compositions, the, mo the ones that are in equilibrium with the, with the stored melt. And you can see that both red and yellow, both eruptions are are always defining a quite narrow uh, cloud of, of composite or both PT space and water, showing that these magmas are stored at similar depth, at similar temperatures, similar water content. Yet again, just for you to remember, one was effusive, one was explosive. So what really drives this difference? I don't know. There you go. So yeah. So I think we, we can make a good case that um, from bulk rock, from crystal scale data, that these two magmas, are, especially on the silicic end, are identical. And so we can really look at the effects of mixing. Because we, as I showed you also, the 1846 has a lot more effects of magma mixing, while the 1932 has very little. So how does that really uh, change or alter eruption dynamics? And this is really a conundrum that goes back for quite some time, and uh, I can't point that out more uh, better than Wes Hildreth did that in the 90s in his paper uh, when he talked uh, uh, in length uh, around uh, about Volkan Kizapu. And he said, 
Well, it is, it is somewhat of a mystery how you have a hornblende dacite magma. So hornblende suggests that there is four to five to eight percent of wa water in the magma, and yet uh, you can preserve those crystals, and I'm showing you them in a second. So you have to get rid of a huge amount of water uh, passively and, and very quietly. There is no fumaroles that had been reported prior to the eruption of the 1846 eruption. And, and the amount of water that you have to get rid of is basically La Laguna in Venada. Uh, so for people that have been in that area, that's quite a bit of water. Surprising that you can't see that uh, having come out in, in this uh, uh, eruption. But, but it has to come out during the eruption because if we start to look at amphibolts, amphibolts are not stable at, great, uh, at shallow pressures because as you decompress, amphibole is going to break down. And uh, so you have to, uh, and if you look at these crystals from 1846, they, a lot of them look actually just as nicely as the one from 1932. So these cannot have been slowly ascending uh, through from the shallow storage region to the surface because otherwise all of them would have to look like this. Some of them do, uh, but not all of them do. So some of these crystals really must have been able to rapidly move from the shallow storage uh, region to the surface. Yet, uh, by the time they get to the surface, uh, the water has to be gone because otherwise you would have an explosive eruption. Okay, so this is kind of the conundrum that, that uh, was always uh, posed at Kisapu. And, and we think we have an, an explanation for this. And, and it relates to the thermal, thermal aspects that um, recharge magmas actually provide. So this is, again, uh, data, data from amphiboles, uh, and now not showing um, pressure versus temperature, but fo uh, FO2 versus temperature. And again, if you zoom in on the ones that have black, uh, black rims, you can see the temperature uh, range is relatively well constrained at about 830 or so to 900 degrees. And again, it, it doesn't matter whether you look at amph amphiboles from 1846 or 1932. And amphibole is a crystal that is only slowly changing to melt to temperatures and so on. So amphibole really represents a long-term temperature record of this magmatic system. Okay, so that's the storage conditions over which this magma uh, was was stored in the crust uh, for long periods of time. If you compare that to iron titanium oxides those can re-equilibrate really quickly, diffusively start to, ch temper you change the temperature, iron titanium oxide's going to record this quite rapidly on the order of hours to days. And if you start to look at that, um, this is work we, I did with Olivier Bachmann uh, quite some time ago, you can see that, well, the day side from 1932 basically gives you that same temperature. Uh, and the, uh, so there is a nice agreement between iron titanium oxides and, and amphibole data. But if you look at the diversity in, in the 1846 data, there is quite a significant spread to very high temperatures. And this is, for example, day sites that are at 1,000 degrees, something that is really not a common uh, uh, temperature for a day site. It should actually be completely crystal free at that point. So this um, is a question that maybe we can discuss at a later point. But, Clearly, there is the, the iron titanium oxides show us in the 1846 that there is some disequilibrium, some changes, especially in terms of temp temperature. So why is that? Well, this is just a, a reminder for me. So if we are looking at this, uh, at this rock, you see all these mafic enclaves in here. And as I told you before, these enclaves are, first of all, mafic. So they are hotter to begin with. And then secondly, they are crystallizing and they are releasing a significant amount of latent heat. So we looked at this uh, from a mass and heat balance perspective for these eruptions. And so this is a simple heat and mass balance calculation, temperature on the y-axis versus silica or mass fraction of recharge. You could look at it that way uh, from the mafic end member to the felsic end member. And really, if we plot the, um, the iron titanium oxides together with the what this checkerboard are the amphiboles, uh, there is no difference in composition and, very, uh, and temperatures for the 1932 eruption, but there are these huge temperature spikes uh, for the 1846 eruption. And it can be actually simply explained by the exchange of latent heat 
but this is the exchange of sensible heat between the mafic and the felsic magma, and the additional evolution of latent heat, because if you look at these mafic enclaves, they are fully crystallized. There's a lot of extra heat that is dumped into the magma. Um, but it requires to be quite, this reheating has to be quite rapid, because otherwise you would resorb back all the crystals in the day side, which we don't see. So there is also a, a certain time scale information there, which I'm not going to go into. Um, but that's that's our model that there is significant reheating, and we we these these uh, um, ice, these um, lines or dashed lines are giving you um, estimates of how much latent heat has to be evolved from the mafic enclaves, and these are actually fully uh, reasonable numbers, somewhere between seventy percent or so. You could see just look at these looking at these uh, these images that seventy percent is absolutely. Uh, no problem in my view. So this is one way to explain it that there is um, Also on top of it, I, I should say that these this latent heat is, is actually delivered also diffusively now To the day side that is surrounding all these mafic enclaves, right? So you really are starting to heat up a day side that is compositionally still very similar sometimes to the previous the, the actual end member, but you're starting to change the temperature significantly to a thousand degrees so that, of course, makes you wonder, if you have a day site at 1,000 degrees, doesn't that change the eruption dynamics? I mean, in my view, that is, uh, was quite obvious. Um, and so we looked very simply, simply at, uh, um, uh, at some uh, conduit models. And this is a simple conflow model from Larry Maston that looks at what, what would happen to a magma as it ascends, let's say, from eight kilometer depth. Uh, and we don't change anything except the temperature, 870 versus 1,000 degrees. So you change the viscosity because of the change in temperature. You're not changing the melt composition, which changes too slightly, is not really relevant here. The major impact that happens here is really the temperature. And then, and because you're changing the temperature and changing the viscosity, what happens is that these these um, jumps here they are associated with fragmentation. These models are clearly not not perfect representations of what happens in the conduit, but it gives you a sense that um, the hotter magma will just be delaying fragmentation significantly. Uh, and you basically have a lot more time to develop bubble networks, to develop pathways for bubbles uh, so that gases can actually leave the system on ascent. So because uh, by the time then you're getting to the surface, you want to erupt explosively, but you ran out of gas. And so you're actually um, going to erupt as an um, effusive lava flow. And unfortunately, I couldn't show you that movie of flying around. There is actually field evidence, in my view, why this is a good explanation. And that is, there is one lava flow that I couldn't show you that is going towards the east. There is a very, very narrow canyon where this lava flow made its way through. And when, when it comes to the, to the end of that canyon, it pans out like a beautiful um, pancake something that a day site flow in that sense would rarely do. And when, when, you talk, when I've talked to a bunch of other uh, volcanologists, it was, you know, lots of experience about many volcanoes, they would say, yeah, that really requires low viscosities for such a day site magma that it is able to just spread out like a pancake. Okay, so there is, there's good reasons to believe that these magmas or these, these uh, lavas from the 1846-47 eruption were in fact uh, low viscosity, high temperature. And I think this is this is a, a simple and easy way to then explain how uh, this this uh, change in eruption dynamics is uh, is is produced. And it's not a single uh, single single place where we can make those arguments. In fact, if we start to look at volcanoes like Unzen, Montserrat, and Pinatubo, Pinatubo is a, is an interesting case. Maybe we can talk about this. But Unzen and Montserrat, none of them have truly plinian eruptions. They have explosive events but they don't have a real Pliny eruption like the 1932 eruption. And when you look at these rocks from Unzen and Montserrat, they're full of enclaves. People have recognized high temperature titanium oxides. So in my view, this is, is a good explanation why these eruptions also didn't uh, evolve into a Pliny eruption, but just these explosive uh, and um, dome collapse uh, features. Pinatubo itself, of course, was a Pliny eruption. There's no, no doubt about that. But if you look at the earliest phases, there is, uh, pri prior to the cataclysmic eruption, there is mingled lavas that actually erupted. 
that also uh, have the record of high temperatures in there. So I think there it was just the budget of mafic recharge to volume that was actually erupted was not working out for Pinot 2. Otherwise, this could have also been shifted to a much less violent eruption. Um, so I think from our study here, what we can say is that really the size of the recharge matters, whether you have a dynamic template uh, that is delivering the heat to large parts of the magmatic system. In a case like this, you're not really been, you're not able to really deliver the heat to the bayside magma. So this would not be able to generate a lava flow. Uh, and then uh, the, the kind of maybe controversial but interesting thought that, that comes out of this is that in terms of hazard mitigation, if that's really true, then if you have a large, large reach, recharge, it actually may mean that sometimes this is lowering the, the danger for a large plinian eruption, okay? Uh, and so this is, this is obviously would be, would be quite interesting whether that is truly is always true or whether that is um, maybe a coincidence. But uh, I think that, well, I guess with geodesy, that's one way to do it, right? By looking at the inflation and deflation and those kind of things. And uh, nowadays, it's actually getting better with all the, uh, the satellite monitoring that is done, right? So that's, that's one way to do it. But whether, the, you know, this is, this is what something we propose, whether that's, you know, this is obviously should be tested further. Absolutely. All right, so I hope, I don't know what the time is, but I hope this is all still good in, in, in terms of timing. Now let me show you some new stuff because this is uh, uh, this other stuff that I think is exciting and uh, since I'm talking to the Chilean community today, I think it's worthwhile bringing it up. Um, but I would like to also come back to this one now and, and ask the question, okay, so clearly these magmas are stirring and moving stuff around, but still what is actually happening at an interface like this? That would be interesting because if, for example, if we think about sulfur as one of the elements that are important for monitoring volcanoes, for um, understanding overall the gas budget in volcanoes, but also understanding how ore, uh, sulfur related ores are formed, we want to understand how, and, but typically what people think is that the sulfur is coming from mafic magmas. So how is the sulfur actually transported from a mafic to a felsic magma? Those are some of the questions we would like to address uh, in, in the long run. We are not quite there yet, but, uh, but that's some, one thing that we're trying to do. And so now I'm moving a little bit away from field studies, go more towards experiments. So we're working uh, using IHPVs, internally heated pressure vessels, and, and cold sealed pressure vessels, nothing that uh, maybe if there is no experimentalist in the room that is not so important. But we are looking basically, we're trying to recreate those, those conditions that I just showed you. We're, create, we're equilibrating a dayside magma, we're equilibrating an andeside magma separately first, then we stick them together into a new gold capsule and heat them up at an intermediate temperature at 1,000 degrees, just what we saw at Kisapu. We're using the compositions of Kisapu, so just so that you know that this is it's related to Kisapu. And then we're running time series experiments. So um, just, uh, I will show you three ones, one for one hour, 10 hours, and 80 hours. Um, and this is the general concept of how we do our experiments. I'm not, I don't I think, think I need to get into too much detail, but of course you can imagine that there potentially could be an evolution of the crystal phases as this, these um, time series experiments go to longer times. And though, so these are now results from this exper these experiments. Uh, again, this is the one hour, 10 hour, 79 hour. I will already kind of remind you for the, for the remind remainder of the talk, whenever I'm showing you basaltic andesite data, so the more mafic end member is on the left hand side, I will, I will always under, uh, put a gray color underneath. So whenever you see these grays, we're talking basaltic andesite. Whenever you see white, we're looking at dayside. So of course, in these experiments that run actually quite long for up to three days, basically, uh, in the day side, you're, we're looking at 1,000 degrees. Everything has been resorbed. All the crystals are gone. Uh, that also gives you a sense maybe for Kisapu how long, how much time between recharge, reheating, and eruption potentially was there. So it's, it's not, clearly these experiments aren't designed for that, but it's definitely something to consider. Uh, and then on the andesite side, it's, it's, there is lots of crystals, and these colors are coded by the different phases. These are X-ray maps. So we looked at all 
uh, x-rays coming off um, these charges. And you can see blue is plagioclase, red is orthopyroxene, green, uh, yellow is clinopyroxene, and the greens are the titanium oxides, iron titanium oxides. You can't quite see all these colors perfectly. There is, but one thing that you may see is that there is, a, the yellows are nicely up here. They start to retreat. They start to retreat further, okay? If you look at the reds, that is maybe even harder to see, but they also start to retreat. So on the right-hand side, you can, uh, let's just focus on this one. This is, again, the phase fractions at this interface, and you can see the yellow starts to retreat to greater and greater distance, and the, and the reds start to retreat to greater and greater distance which are the pyroxenes basically melting back as these two magmas are um, interacting with each other. Of course, plagioclase is also uh, melting, uh, is equilibrating and melting bad back, but that's not so important for this story. The interesting thing here is that if you're melting a lot of pyroxenes, what are you dumping into the melt is a lot of Fe2+. Plus. And so there is the potential that you're changing the FO2 locally in these environments. And so that's where it's going to be interesting when we're talking about, um, for example, ore forming processes and in general, how is sulfur transferred between a mafic and a felsic magma. Of course, you can always think of bubbles moving through and they, they might, might have a different time scale and may not be affected by this. But let's consider just the diffusion case, which I think is, is worthwhile in its own way. This is data to look at the, the compositional diversity. Of course, what you see here, so these are the three runs again, and then you see these, this is a little tiny. There is uh, iron, magnesium, sodium, potassium uh, in these diagrams on the left-hand side, again, the andesite. You do see these diffusion gradients that are beautifully developed inside the day site where you have no crystals. It's easy to measure, and you can see that there is clearly exchange between day site and andesite. You also can see that, for example, here it's beautiful, to see that, for example, this is magnesium at the interface, you actually have a high concentration of magnesium while it's dropping to both sides. And the reason why it's dropping even in the andesite is because the glass itself, there is not much magnesium because most of the magnesium is in, in the mafic phases at that point. And it's only at the interface where you're dumping a lot of magnesium and iron two plus, as I said, to the, interf to the interface. And then, uh, and then silica is on, on this diagram. So you can see these are simple diffusion gradients that evolve. And, and we want to explore in greater detail now what is this effect, uh, the, the oxidation, of, potential oxidation effect at the interface. Um, there's, this is a, one thing that I'm going to jump uh, over quickly. But it, there are some interesting observations when you think, look at, because we are looking at natural samples, we can actually measure the entire periodic table. And you can see that there is some interesting uphill diffusion, question mark, going on at the interface for some incompatible elements. The more compatible elements, they show just some, uh, um, the simple um, resorption of mafic phases and then the delivery of cobalt into the daysite magma. So that's simple. But this one is something that we're puzzled over and not quite understanding yet. Um, but I'll, I'll jump over this. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, because I think the really interesting story, one that we didn't expect, uh, is uh, in the next five or six slides. And then actually this is the end. So to give you a sense of how much uh, longer this talk is going to be. So we, we wanted to understand how elements are transferring between the mafic and the felsic magma. And one way to, to explore this is, for example, what happens uh, to, to, to iron? Can we look at iron 2 plus moving around versus iron 3 plus moving around? And one way to do that is to actually measure the Fe3 plus to total iron content, for example, in the glass of the day side. So here's the interface to the andesite to the left, and then the day side. And what you see is that the 3 plus to total iron is, is dropping significantly always at the interface. It is, seems to be leveling out a little bit for the longest duration experiment. So sorry, I should point that out. The blue is the one hour, the red is the 10 hour, and the green is the 80 hour experiment. But we do see huge variations. So this is 20, 30% changes in the Fe3 plus at the interface. And of course, this is correlated with the amount of iron we see at that interface, because that's the iron that is coming from the andesite, moves over to the day side, and you're delivering a lot of Fe2 plus, dropping this and overall increasing total iron over there. The way we measure this is by going to a synchrotron source in Chicago, the advanced photon source, so you can measure uh, 
uh, the iron Fe3 plus the total iron by so-called iron zanes, uh, a, me a method to look at um, the energy distribution uh, similar, somewhat similar to overall um, um, iron microprobe overall, uh, uh, electron microprobe, but it's uh, obviously at much higher energies and you can do a lot more things with that. Um, so if you have this Fe3 plus over total iron and Fe or melt composition as a whole, you can actually using Kress and Carmichael, using um, Baker and Moretti, there are ways to translate that into an FO2. Uh, and so that's what we did. And when you look at the FO2, something what people always consider is that FO2 isn't really changing. This is something that is one of those, those variables that you don't worry so much about. Your system is FO, uh, at Q of M plus two or three or whatever. And then, and then you're going uh, and do everything else with your, with your samples. But what we find here is right at that interface, we see dramatic changes in, in FO2. The vessel itself, our experiments are quite oxidized and that's an issue is we decided that on purpose. These are very oxidized Q of M plus four. So, um, because we didn't want to have sulfides in our experiments. We actually, in this case, we wanted to get away from sulfur uh, because it's quite difficult to, to work with otherwise. So, but these are sulfur, they have sulfur in them, but they are also fate. Anyway, so the, you can see at the far field away from the interface, these, these, um, the data basically recovers more or less the, the FO2 of the impo the, what the vessel imposes. And then right at the interface, it, the FO2 plummets by almost two log units. So that's huge. Of course, we're looking at FMQ plus four. If we were to think about something that is at FMQ plus one, well, suddenly you could have a zone where sulfide to sulfide fade is just transitioning forth and back. And it could, this could basically be a trap. And it's not clear how sulfur is moving from a mafic to a felsic magma because it might actually get stuck right in that interface, okay? So that's, uh, of course, hypothetical because again, these experiments are at much higher uh, FO2, but it's something that we, we at least are entertaining and considering in future, for future experiments. So how do we explain this? I think I gave away one way, this, uh, the answer already, and, and one way how that could be explained is just the delivery of these two plus irons that are basically dropping down uh, the three plus to total iron ratio on the interface and therefore uh, changing locally the, the FO2, okay? That's how we explain that. So we thought this is, this is cool, uh, and unfortunately we didn't have a complementary picture of, of the andesite. In, in hindsight, we could have measured it with Zanes as well. But we were lucky enough that the base andesite side actually has two oxides in it. So you can do FO2 estimates using, again, two oxides. And so this is the spinel composition of these oxides, uh, the titanium amount of, uh, in, 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 a, in a spinel, and here uh, the titanium basically in an ilmenite uh, oxide. And you, what you can see is that there is a clear change all again to the interface. Now we're talking about the andesite, so the other side. Uh, there's a clear change associated with all three, uh, three experiments right at the interface a lowering of the titanium concentrations in these oxides, okay? So one can go to, uh, to models that, ex that use these compositions to extract FO2. And, and the most, uh, most recent one that really is uh, uh, quite useful because it really only looks at iron titanium oxides. It doesn't look at whether you have quartz in the system, whether these all are communicating with each other. This is really just looking the, at these two uh, mineral phases, whether these are getting into equilibrium is, um, can be, we can use a model from Gyozo and Evans to look at that. And this is again, the ilmenite uh, frac uh, com uh, fraction versus the ulvo spinel fraction here. And this is a so-called uh, Roosbohm diagram. It doesn't really matter, but that what, what you can see is there's contour levels and those are referring to, for example, FO2. So here is plus one and a half, two and a half, uh, three, and so on. And then there's temperature counters in there as well. You can see at the, at the end where we are, very low in titanium in both cases, temperature is really not well determined. So we, we can't really say anything about temperature. But what we can say nicely is something about FO2 because that actually is still quite sensitive at this very low 
uh, end member of uh, titanium poor aluminides and spinels. And you can see that if you were to go to lower titanium, what you do, you actually uh, re realize an oxidation right at the interface. So if we translate this information into an FO2, what we see on the other side of our experiments is an FO2 that goes up from four to five and a half. So now this got really, we got really nervous because this is now an extreme profile that you really are seeing in these, in these charges where you have the zigzagging going on right at the interface and we're still very much puzzled on the mech, I mean, this cannot be explained simply by dropping a, a Fe2 plus into the meld because then you would actually, even here, you would expect some kind of uh, local, um, local reduction. Uh, but, so there needs to be some other mechanisms uh, and you can see that over the course of three, three experiments, 80 hours, this basically this, this gradient right at the interface of about two log units or a little less, one and a half, is basically stable even for the longest experiments. Um, so that suggests that this is not a, you know, just a little artifact uh, that happens early on in these experiments, but something that is really um, quite persistent. Three days, I'd argue, is, is a relatively long experiment and um, is um, suggests that this could e also be 30 days. I'm not sure why that shouldn't be the case. Um, so one way to explain it, is, as I said, was the iron 2 plus, but there is some issues on the andesite side. The other thing is, if we look at just how many silicon ions are moving one way and silicon mo ions moving the other way, how many magnesium ions moving one way, how many magnesium ions moving the other way, we can look at the charge balance. Of course, the, the big elephant in that room is we don't know how oxygen is moving around. And so if oxygen is the big ion that is not moving at all, because it's a two plus anion, uh, two minus anion, uh, then this calculation that I'm showing you here is fine, but if oxygen is actually able to move around, then we might be uh, in trouble. But so this is now basically looking at the charge imbalance. If you just look at these compositional uh, data sets and think about, okay, how much two plus iron is, two, uh, two, uh, two, how, much, how many electrons are moving this way and how many electrons are moving that way? Just doing a uh, charge balance, and what we find is exactly that kind of profile right there. So we wonder whether that is actually really, um, in some ways, a battery. And that's, you know, when I talk to some experimentalists at, at Le Monde about uh, this, then I, they always get a little nervous. They wonder whether the spark and the, the lightning comes out of the sample at any moment. But um, so this, if that were really true, then you would charge up this interface in some kind of interesting way. In some ways, I wonder why that, why that isn't impossible, because if you think about thermocouples, there you're also charging up two systems that are chemically not happy, really, and they're moving electrons around. In our case, we're moving ions around. So um, maybe, maybe that is possible. But it suggests that there is an interesting uh, boundary layer that evolves, and that may have implications in terms of the sulfur budget and how sulfur is moving from, one, from a mafic end member to a felsic end member. And of course, if sulfur is trying to move through that, it may take chalcophile elements with it, but whether they are able to really move the same way through such an interesting FO2 gradient is, is a question that we're, we're exploring right now with Adam Simon and Adrian to, to explore whether this has any relevance for, for ore formation processes. Um, and just to highlight um, the complexities with sulfur, of course, is that uh, if you look at whether it is a sulfur, so over here you would, would be at, at, at these oxygen fugacities, low oxygen fugacities would be at sulfide, uh, and here you would be at sulfate. Uh, of, there is the interesting thing with sulfur is that the change between sulfate and sulfide is very, very rapid over one log unit. So these gradients we're looking at are just in that kind of, uh, kind of uh, um, range. And then, of course, the complexity with sulfur furthermore is that uh, it's not a single line that for all compositions, but it's also compositionally dependent. We are moving compositions around as well. So that makes this entire story maybe more complicated, but something that we want to explore in, in the future. So I hope uh, I was able to um, provide you with some interesting new, new thoughts. First of all, that QSAPU is an excellent system to look at uh, effects of magma mixing on all scales, on the scale of an eruption uh, 
the eruption dynamics as well as on the scale of just an interface between two magmas. Uh, we can nicely approximate it by simple binary mixing uh, concepts, uh, have good control, I would say, from the mineral and whole rock chemistry. And then what we find, I'm um, just highlighting two fi findings from, from the work we've done over the years there, is that recharge uh, and mixing may control the behavior of large silicic eruptions in, in, again, in some ways against what we think from conventional wisdom, where we have hot recharge reducing the potential for explosive eruptions. And then secondly, during mixing, we may have significant oxygen fugacity gradients within uh, different um, parts of the, of the mixing system, and that ha may have strong effects on the partitioning of oxy-sensitive elements. And I think with that, uh, I'll just remind you, if you're still not interested, maybe you're now, but um, thank you very much. Is, is, is bad or it's good? It's about three. Oh, you, well, uh, you, I mean, the question is whether, you know, once it's at the surface, I guess you at some point you lose those charges. But, uh, but as long, I mean, this is, is during the process, right? I mean, ultimately, there, if you had these systems equilibrating over time, of course, FO2 will flatten out again. It's just as long as there is elemental exchange, Maybe, I mean, I'm very careful because people at Lamont also have, you know, some of the ex experimentalists there have been very worried about this. They wonder how this could be possible, but uh, why not? So um, it, as long as there is diffusive gradients and movement, it, it could very well be. It really is a question of what oxygen is doing. If oxygen is balancing it out, then we'll have to think of other ways. But yeah. more seriously about that, if you uh, are able to translate into amounts of F3 plus. You know, you can... Sure, yeah, we can, we can. Sure. Are they the same on both sides of the experiment? Because what you can have is that you have lots of iron in one and a little iron in the other, but the same amount of iron. Unfortunately, you can't quite... It's not as easy to do those mass balances. In fact, if we were, if we were thinking in terms of the charge balance, what I showed you, we have plenty of charges to do a battery in terms of how many charges are moving around. Uh, but the issue is, of course, in experiments, the vessel itself can still, through hydrogen diffusion and so on, buffer things. Uh, and then it's not, it's not something that was three plus is not three plus anymore and so on. We do, you know, so that's, it's not as easy to do a simple mass balance and as if there is one two plus or three plus liberated and moving over that actually may be changed in these experiments because, uh, but you can see, Nonetheless, not all of them are changed, obviously. So unfortunately, it would be nice to, to look at this on a really atom by atom basis, basically. But that's hard. In order to concentrate more, you may suffer in both at a general operation on what you just talked about. The, the initial step is hydro mixing and vertical. Sure. But then you have other of course. Well, and, but it's still one, as far as I, I'm really not the ore mineralization person, but of course, in some ways, uh, you still, the, the concept as far as I always understand it's that most people would think that the sulfur is moving from the mafic to the felsic and then takes the goodies with it, but then it moves into a very different part of the magmatic system where it cools off and then it's going to dump uh, gold and copper and so on at, at, at the lower temperatures, right? So that's, and then there's an alteration associated with that too. Is it, am I? Not locally in that location, I don't think so. And, and I, I would think uh, that, that all these, these metals are moved away from that interface. Uh, well, that's what people at least think at this point. Um, if I. <laughs> Well, I mean, so we are really at very high FO2. So we're really dealing only with sulfate in our experiments. 
Uh, but we we would like to. I mean, we are doing experiments. I, mean, I don't know if I'm answering your question. Let me know. But we are we are we are doing experiments that are now at FMQ QFM plus one or whatever. Where if these processes are happening, you could have a zone that is much more reducing, and suddenly as your sulfur is trying to move through, it's going to get precipitated right at the interface. And there is actually I was just surprisingly reading uh, an article about mixing in, in oceanic environments, a mush, mushy uh, piece of uh, rock from, from oceanic uh, uh, mid-ocean ridges, they found frequently sulfides just on the rim of these. And I was like, whoa, if that's really true, well, that could be something that relates to this. Whether, you know, that's, that was just an observation that would match up, but I'm not, so this would, to really look at the sulfur fugacity and, and so you, to understand how these interconnect and how these re respond to each other, you have to do those experiments at low FO2. Right now, the sulfur is happily six plus everywhere, even even when you have these very uh, reduced, very reducing conditions um, in at the interface because they're still not reducing. Really. Um. And regarding volcanic hazard, do you feel you can maybe? Argentina because Chile, you don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is all over there. <laughs> well, I mean, this is this is something that I, you know, I, I think I'm I am not better prepared to speak to these topics that compared to the people from San Joaquin. I mean, to be really honest, right? I mean, they know much better what's going on with these volcanoes, but we. You know, I'm one of the people that look at magmatic processes and I'm trying to understand what's happening in the subsurface. And so, I mean, this is still a way to, to connect uh, to how that relates to to, um, to forecasting and so on, right? And and so one thing that I always, what, what I'm wondering right now is how much, for example, Chai-10 is, uh, whether that is, was any recharge associated with it. There's none, no evidence for it, but uh, on the other hand, um, and, and it was explosive, obviously, so it can't be, if my model is correct, then that can't be uh, much there. But the surprising thing is that it's also so crystal poor. One way that it's always explained is because it's ascending so quickly, but this is a rhyolite uh, that is ascending really quickly. If it were slightly heated, it actually wouldn't crystallize and could descend slower and still, you know, would do fine. So th those those are questions that are, and that, those then connect to uh, to to processes associated with eruption dynamics. So under, really, under, we don't really understand. I think what obviously what happens at the, in the conduits, and and there's there's two camps. In, at least in the U.S., always there's the people that really care about the conduit dynamics and want to understand uh, or make, explain everything purely from what happens in the conduit. And then there's people like me who think that it's the conduit is just the represent is just you know the. Um, Everything how this is set up in the in the magma chamber prior to entering the conduit is really what matters, and so understanding that context is is much more important. But you're more uh, worried about conduit volcanism, not something like the other than what they. I, I I care more because you know I care more about the intermediate sized eruptions because they actually happen every ten years globally, while these huge eruptions they. May happen sometime, but let's hope not. But if they happen, then why care? <laughs> Anyways, to be honest. Um, well, I mean, roughly speaking, right? I mean, this is within the uncertainties. And it's not, if you put that back into, if you put five cubic kilometers back into the crust, it's not very thick anyways. So I wouldn't worry about, about that too much. Um, I, I think that's an uncertainty of the measurements. So clearly, I mean, they could have come to the same depth, uh, but, uh, you know, next to each other. There's no, you could come up with many ways to, to make this, um, the ar architecture down there. But... Um, I think that that is would be all just speculation because you just don't have that resolution. So one way would be maybe to look at melt inclusions or so that have better, somewhat better resolution. Um, but we haven't done that. Again, 
Agradecemos al profesor Rupert. Gracias. Sí, muchas gracias.